Well, hi there. This is Stacey Barr, and I'm here with Adam Voigt. Adam is a former teacher and school principal who's become obsessed about learning and the high-level transformative learning that happens when you can create great learning cultures. His work in transforming dozens of Australian schools as um, CEO of Real Schools is well-renowned and he provides the education comment even for the project. And for our non-Aussie listeners, the project is an Australian news and current affairs and talk show on TV. Now, Adam also has a passion for bringing great learning activity, learning relationships and learning cultures to the business community where learning uh, can become a truly sustainable competitive advantage. So Adam, welcome. And I'd love to hear a bit more about the work that you do. Oh, thank you, Stacey, for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, my work, I guess, is split in two. So there's the work of Real Schools, which we, we started about six years ago now, and with the intention of partnering with as many Australian schools as we could to build really strong cultures within them, which we find is funny because, you know, you ask everybody, to school, is school culture important? And they say yes, and then you ask them what it is, and everyone puts their hand back down. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, so what we work with schools about is defining that and getting really clear about what it is they want to stand for and then strategizing to be able to you know partner side by side with them to be able to do that and then the other side of my work is that real learners work which is about bringing learning theory learning activity you know, good learning relationships asking people to think about who the best teachers that they ever had were and what were the the tips and tricks that we could bring to the bring to their business for improved performance and learning and growth and development Development and then ultimately how you build those learning cultures that really mean that your, your people grow and do fantastic stuff and that's where that competitive advantage stuff comes in, I suppose. Indeed. You, um, you mentioned you know, that that word culture is obviously very, very important and, and a learning culture in particular. It's one of those uh, intangible sorts of things, just like you pointed out with the example of you know people want culture but when they have to describe what it is or what it should be, it's really, really tough. And this, this has a, um, a fair bit to do with why I wanted to interview you, Adam, because I often get questions from my subscribers about how to measure another relatively intangible concept around, around schools, and that is just this broad thing called school effectiveness. And I know you, you know this like the back of your hand. So I figured that you and I could get down and dirty and I could uh, guide a practical conversation for the two of us to have around how to make school effectiveness measurable and maybe even have a go at designing a measure or two for it. Yeah, that sounds like a good plan to me. I think that you know, any learning opportunity where you actually get a bit of a demo and you get the chance to actually do some worthwhile work is, um, is an exciting opportunity. So I'm up for it. Let's go. Super. Now, probably we're going to have listeners to this um, who are in two camps. The first camp will be those people who've come to learn my measurement methodology, Pump, from me. And so they'll know and understand the techniques that, um, that Adam, you and I are going to use. But then there'll be a whole group, another camp, a group of people who have not been familiar with Pump or familiar with these measurement techniques. And I think if you're in that second camp, um, listeners, then just roll with it. Just notice the kinds of questions that I'm asking Adam and the kinds of uh, things that we're doing to this concept of school effectiveness as we go through it. And don't get too hung up on the actual technique itself. So we're going to do this in two parts. Um, the first part is to take this phrase school effectiveness and really understand what it means because if, if it's not concrete, if it's not observable in the real world, it's going to be impossible to measure. Uh, and just like that, learning culture concept, you have to find a way to describe it tangibly before you can really see it, hear it, feel it, understand it. So Adam, school effectiveness, I'll just type that into the template here. This is what we're trying to understand and make measurable. It's a result, isn't it, Adam? It's a result that a lot of schools want to have. They want to be able to say, we are effective. Yeah, that's very true. You know, there's obviously multiple measures of that and they had habit of you know, pulling themselves towards the negative, but it certainly is a result to be an effective school. Great. So the next step to, to getting closer to, to making this meaningfully measurable is to really understand what it is. Now, I talk about weasel words. Uh, they're vague, fluffy, 
broad kinds of words that don't say a lot, even though they dominate uh, the business landscape, um, political landscape, and we're just so used to hearing them. Effectiveness is one of those weasel words. And it's weaselly because depending on the context it's used in, depending on who's using it, it can mean so many different things. So if you're a leadership team, um, or you have a leadership team, Adam, in a particular school and they want to know that their school is effective, what does effectiveness mean to them? What are some of the, the ways that you could describe that? And, and I challenge you, Adam, and this might not be a challenge for you given your education background, is to put this language into, into language a 10-year-old would understand. Yeah, and so I think if you did ask, uh, if you ask school, are you asking for the, the, the weasel words, Stacey? No, no, and for what, what the, that weasel word of effectiveness, school effectiveness, what that means, what could that mean, what are the, the, the different parts oh, of it? If you were explaining to a 10-year-old yeah. what is school effectiveness, what sorts of things would you say? Okay, no, no worries. So I, I think effectiveness, first of all, is kids who love learning. So I always contend that there are two parts to whether a school is focused well enough on the learning component and it is do the kids learn the right stuff and then do they learn to love learning. So um, we do a lot of, we spend a lot of time you know, measuring things in schools that measuring kids effectiveness um, at certain skills and um, co whether they can regurgitate content that is completely irrelevant. So I would say that there's that. And then I guess the other component of an effective school would be, are we working with parents to turn them into decent citizens? To turn the parents and into decent citizens? No, to turn the kids into <laughs> decent citizens. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the I think that's what, bigger, wouldn't they, if you had to make the parents? Yeah, that's decisions. right. So I, I think when I, you know, when I ask parents, you know, um, what do you think schools should be for? They tell me that they should be for learning, and they should be for socialising, learning how to be with other people, and they're the big things. Yet we talk about everything around the peripheral except those things. So for me, an effective school does those three things in an intentional kind of way. Lovely. So I've got that. A school is effective when the kids are learning the right stuff, they, they come to love learning and they become decent citizens. Yes, I'd agree with that. Now, you did say working with parents specifically, and in my mind that's kind of part of the how that the kids become decent citizens, but I want to check that with you, Adam. Is that something that's, that's really important, that, you, that you're an effective school um, based in part on, on the way that you work with parents, or is it more about kids become decent citizens? Yeah, there's a little bit of process and outcome about that, isn't there? But you know what we know is some of the some of the schools that are really doing well, even in disadvantaged places, are now saying that they don't enrol kids in the school; they enrol families because they know that you just can't get those three things to work in any cohesive way unless you're working with the family. Mm. So I think being explicit about saying that we are we stand for working with parents, and the bit that we work with them about is about how we're helping to grow really good citizens out of those kids. Lovely. I might tidy up a bit of the language here because I think we're, we've probably pretty quickly arrived at some really good, um, what I call performance results. They're the performance results that an overarching goal implies. Now, an overarching goal is school effectiveness and the specific performance results it implies are um, probably the result that kids love learning, um, probably a yep. result that kids are learning the right stuff. Yep. And maybe it's um, the school is uh, or the school works with with parents to make the kids decent citizens. How, how do you feel about that language? I've just sort of captured there. Yeah, you might even you know. I mean, make sounds a bit like we're forcing them sometimes. But the you know that maybe that last one is about building decent citizens. I like that. To build decent citizens. Okay. At this point, I would say we don't need to get these words any better than kind of 80% there, 80% good at, at saying what they, they really should be saying. Do you think we're at the 80%? Yeah, very comfortable with that. There's nothing about that that I go, oh, I'm not sure. Yeah, that, they're, they're fine. Nice. All right. So the next check um, is, and this is something that uh, we do if if we have a, a really broad goal like school effectiveness where it can mean lots of different things, we, we make sure that in our kind of the de-weaseling we just did, we, we just make sure that we haven't got anything multi-barreled, like are there, is there more than one result wrapped up in one of these statements? 
Adam, I look at it and I don't see um, that e any of those three statements are um, just going to make that a little bit easier to look at. There we go. Uh, are meaning more than one thing. Like kids love learning. That's one particular thing. Um, kids are learning the right stuff. It's one particular thing. And the school works with parents to build decent citizens. One particular thing. Do you agree? Yeah, I do. And but do you? Yeah. You're pointing out something that we in schools far too often do is we we roll um, a multitude of different responsibilities into big motherhood statements. So mm. you have me check whether it's a there's a single focus here is yeah I think that's a skill that we could do well with in schools. Not just in schools, funnily enough, but it's a it's a really important thing, Adam, because if we don't do it. Um, you end up with a statement that is so that, that, that has it's actually talking about different performance attributes and they can't be measured with just one thing and until you tease them out and really look at them and see them clearly as two separate things you don't get any closer to coming up with a measure so that's that's why I'm a bit pedantic about this step of not having any multi focus in any of these results yeah it makes a lot of sense groovy all right um, are those three things all essentially important for every school? Yeah, I believe so. I think they're universal things that go to, I guess, the purpose of a, of, of a school in terms of what you're trying to do is you know, part of your mission is to send kids away from your influence ready to be successful in the world in whatever it is that they choose to do. Um, but I also think that's those three things are very deeply ingrained in what teachers and school leaders really want to do, what they what they would say is their purpose for working with kids. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really comfortable with that. Lovely. Um, I'm going to um, ask you another question about them too. What, what I just asked you then was should, should these really be measured? Should, are they important that they, they really do deserve attention? And you said yes to that. You gave a really good yeah. um, reason why. The next thing I want to ask is um, can schools do something about these? I mean, are, are these three results within the circle of influence of a school's leadership team, for example, to make them happen? They are, but they're a step to the side of what they're often compelled to measure. And so they can measure these things, um, but at the moment the tools that are provided for them to, to measure, and there's a lot of them, uh, are often to measure things that are just to the just two steps to the right of each of those things. So um, it, it would have to be something that a school would need to do really intentionally, but can they? Yes. Okay, great. And do you think they're likely to? Will they? Will they um, commit resources and time, do you think, to not just measuring these things, Adam, but, but improving them, wanting to, to make them better and better? To have more kids love learning more, to have more kids learning more of the right stuff and to, and to work more with parents to, to get more decent citizens. Yeah, I believe they will. Are they all now? I'll, I'll, the answer to that is no. But um, there are some that are trying to measure that and, um, and, and I think given the support to do so would, would really step willingly into that space. Groovy. So what, what's happened now, Adam, is your three results that define school effectiveness have just passed what I call the should, can, will test, which means they're worthy of being measured. It's worth putting the time and effort into, into figuring out how to measure them and, and bringing those measures to life. That makes sense, yeah. Cool. So um, one last thing to check is, and, and I don't actually know this, and do schools have strategic plans? Yes, they do. They often have two levels. So they'll have one that is a three to four year long term plan for the school. Mm -hmm. And they have what they'll usually call some sort of operational plan, which is a bit of a 12 month um, you know, commitment to what they're trying to do in the short term. It sounds pretty much like how most business does this kind of thing um, or does strategic yes. planning. So. Do these three results that define school effectiveness, where do they sit in the strategic plan for, for a school? Are they, um, are they really the ultimate outcomes or are they really just high level stuff that contributes to something even more important than school effectiveness? Probably the three statements in, in various um, ways and at various levels of commitment. So the kids learning the right stuff, we do a lot of measurement around that, the, that mm -hmm. middle one there. Um, we do some 
measurement or an observation of whether the kids love learning or not, but do we, uh, are schools compelled to measure the love of learning as equally as they measure the, the what they learn? No. So um, I'd say the middle one, you know, we definitely do a lot of measurement around that already and there's that, that, that's evident in strategic plans. We're obsessed with that. Mm-hmm. Um, but the other two, I would say that we we pay some lip service to it. Right. But um, do you think that there, that more schools are wanting to, to build that, you know, like the love of learning and the decent citizens to results? Are more schools, do you think, wanting to, to build that into their strategic direction and to give more than lip service to it? Undoubtedly. I think that every school leader in the country would say they want to be able to work on this and to be able to prove their progress. Mm -hmm. Um, But at the moment, I would say that the the tools and their compliances are more built around the middle stuff, the middle statement there around kids learning the right stuff. Um, But even then, I guess there's a lot of measurement that goes on that um, is not, it's of what they're learning, but is it the right stuff? It would be the question that we'd overlay over that. Ah, interesting. Yeah. Okay, so these are strategically important to to most, if not all, schools. Then, yeah, I would say they are, and their commitment to that, and I guess intentionality around that, it would be the thing that we'd find a lot of variation around. Great. So what we've just done is put school effectiveness through what I call the measurability test, which is taking something that sounds strategically important and that everybody should should have it, and we've made it understandable. We've brought it down into concrete language. We've checked to make sure that it really is something that, that schools um, should, can, and will work on and improve, and we've tested how it links to to the, the strategic direction or the, the strategically important things for schools. So. What we've done is turn this phrase, Weasley phrase, school effectiveness into kids love learning, kids are learning the right stuff, and schools work with parents to build decent citizens. I think that was brilliantly done, Adam. No, well, thank you. I didn't feel brilliant, but um, <laughs> you obviously know what you're doing with this stuff, Stacey, because it's working. <laughs> there you have it. I love this technique. I used to do this technique um, before I taught it as a as a step by step thing. I just do it in conversation um, because it it seemed like a natural thing for me because I wanted to understand the the goal to a point where I could imagine how I'd measure it. Uh, and most goals aren't written that way. So I kind of found myself asking the same questions over and over again, and the questions are now in this template. So it does make it easier then to um, for, for anybody to be able to do the same thing. It does. And, I mean, I, I would love to, you know, the, you know just, just that thinking process there of being able to have schools before they write a strategic plan is to just do that 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 kind of thinking, to pass their thinking through those rings that you've put mm. in front of me today. So, yeah, that would be a really valuable tool. Agreed. And I think you've just described the perfect way for them to use it, the perfect time for them to use it. It's before they formalise the strategic plan for sure. Yeah, before all those old defaults just creep in and we write them because we got them. And they do creep in. (laughs) All right. Well, we will take, I think, one of these and put it through the next technique, which I wanted to use with you, Adam, which is, designing a measure for it. So the thinking to do to come up with a way to quantify how much the result's happening. Adam, I'd like to pick the first one if you're okay with that, but I am I am open to negotiation. No, I think if you were going to ask me which Christmas present I'd open, I'd go with that one too. Kids love learning. Let's find out if we can quantify that somehow. <laughs> so I'm going to switch over to... Um, my measure design technique looks a little bit the same only because it's in tables and it's all formatted in the same colours, but there are different steps in this one, Adam. So I'm going to just paste in at the top here, kids love learning. We want to find a measure for that. That's going to be the output of this next little series of steps we're going to go through. Mm. We're not going to jump straight to the measures though, Adam. I'm not sure if you notice this, but when people come up with measures, often they just brainstorm stuff or talk about the stuff they already know. What's your experience with, with that? Yeah, it is. Uh, that, that is. And so what we end up is that, that group think, I guess, you know, where we just list everything that we think comes into a kid loving learning. So I'm interested to see what that pre-step is. 
So this pre-step is to not even think about numbers or measures or quantification at all, but instead to come back and, and uh, channel that 10-year-old again and describe what would we see or hear or feel or what, what are the things we could detect or observe in the real world that would convince us that kids love learning. Now, we're likely to have quite a few of these, but we might stop after we've got maybe half a dozen or so. What's the first yeah. thing you think of, Adam? What would you see that would convince you that, that a kid was loving learning? For me, it's kids that describe themselves as a learner. Yeah. So they, they say that, oh, yeah, I'm good at learning stuff. I'm good. I love it. I can just see it. I can hear it. I'm good at learning but stuff. Excellent. You, what, I guess the, the flip of that is the opposite, which is what we you know, really need to work so hard to avoid is when kids don't think they can learn and means that they just experience shame and embarrassment in the learning environment and then they, they mess it up. Can you observe that shame and, and embarrassment? Yes, you can. Yeah, so kids either withdraw or they avoid or they attack other people or they attack themselves. So they, you know, they either, you know, wreck it and blame other people or they just go, I suck at this, and which means that I can't get anywhere with it. Um, you know, they withdraw. They, with little kids, you'll get ones that are hiding under the desk because you ask them to, you know, read oh. or with old a wag yeah. <laughs> and not school, you know, and avoidance is that, you know, uh, where we're really concerned that they're, you know, as, as adults, that's where you know, even things like alcohol come in. We just don't want to feel like this anymore. And that's where we get teenagers who feel that shame and failure, who start to experiment with ways to not feel that way. And we, we as schools need to be mindful that we're contributing to that. That, and that, that links to your third result about uh, working with parents to build decent citizens. Um, that I can see straight away how this is just one <clears throat> one way that how much kids love learning can influence that other result of, of becoming a decent citizen. That's exactly right. And that's why I think it's not just, you know, in schools we have a habit of measuring what they learn, but we really need to understand that it doesn't matter because whatever we teach them now is going to be obsolete by the time they've got a job. So mm -hmm. um, it's really about whether they believe they can love learning so they can learn on the job because that's what they'll need to do. Yeah, beautiful. You mentioned um, wagging before. Did I hear that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so that's that uh, um, that withdrawal strategy that when you feel shame, you just don't go. Get that's out of um, a word I may need to explain to an international audience here. In my, I don't know if it's an Australian <laughs> colloquialism, but wagging basically yeah, means well. not going, to school, <laughs> going down the beach or going to the shopping mall or somewhere else other than yeah. school. Yeah, I think our international guests would be familiar with truancy, perhaps. That would be the, you know, as much as that might be a weasel word, that would, that's what we're talking about. <laughs> it is, it is. Uh, outside Australia, wagging's probably something that a dog's tail does and nothing more. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to limit my colloquialisms from here in. <laughs> no, I love it. <laughs> um, how about one more? Let's go for one more. Um, so it, these are sensory descriptions, really. You know, what would you see here, or or touch, or detect somehow in the in the real world that would convince you that a kid loved learning? I think it's um, it, it's kids who feel and behave safely in the learning environment. So it means they're happy to be at school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, you know, for some for some kids, schools the the only safe place in their life. And so what you want to be able to see is kids who walk past that school gate and kind of the tension drops off their shoulders. They just go, oh, thank goodness I'm at school. And, you know, so they feel safe. They feel happy because when they do, that's when you can think straight you can perform. Lovely. And th that is observable, isn't it? You can, um, you can observe happiness. There's no doubt about that. Um, is there a way that you can know by looking at a kid whether they feel safe at school or not, or is that something that would come out more in a, in a conversation with them or other information you had about them? It can, and it's often a, a, a leveraging of relationship with the with a teacher or a school leader, just someone who knows the kids and can and can detect, can just see that. Hang on, something's not right here. Um, you know, a great principal that I know used to say that you know his his job description. He went and took his job description, and ripped it up before. Um, when he took the job mm -hmm. and he said, my job is to make sure that the kids are happier when they arrive at school than when they leave. 
So they have to be they have to be delighted to get to school, and they have to be a bit disappointed that they get sent home. Oh, <laughs> and, that's, um, that's lovely. It is, and um, they have to be annoyed that the three fifteen bell goes. So I thought that was really cool. Yeah, wow. There's a there's a, a kind of a similar um, concept in safety in the workplace. Um, I don't see a lot of organisations using it, but I really love the idea of it that people leave work um, healthier and and uh, healthier and I don't know if it's safer. I don't, it's healthier and something else. They leave work healthier than they arrived. Yeah, it's something about and the workplace yeah, really looking after them. Proactive. It is a big environmental imperative, isn't it? You know, you've got to feel that you can perform. And, that, and because that gets amplified when you feel safe, you perform well. So you, you feel the progress and that's exciting. So you leave thinking, oh, this is, it's pretty cool to be in this place. Mm. Love it. I might even add that in. I didn't write it down while you were saying it. I was getting too caught up in it. So um, uh, happier to arrive at um, school than to leave school. Great. Yep. Uh, that might do for their sensory evidence. Now, like if we were doing this full on with a, um, an executive team, a leadership team at a school, we'd spend a little bit more time on this, uh, I'd imagine, and, and we might end up with five or six descriptions that really nailed this um, physical evidence, sensory evidence of kids love learning. We'll stop here though, Adam, because I want to start getting into the quantification piece now. So. We've described cool. the stuff that we'd observe, and now what we've got to figure out is how could we quantify what we're observing. Does that make sense? Yes. So the way we'll do this is we'll just pick one piece of sensory evidence first, that first one, that kids describe themselves as a learner. They say stuff like, I'm good at learning stuff. Can you think of any way that you could quantify how much that's happening? And you might want to think about how many kids are, are, are describing themselves that way or is there is some other thing that you could quantify that would, would tell you how much kids are seeing themselves as good learners? I think with kids, they're, they're pretty good at being able to respond to statements in terms of how true they are for them. Mm -hmm. So you know, I feel like if you said, you know, I'm, I'm good at learning new things, to a kid, do you think that's you know super true? <laughs> is it kind of true? Yeah. Is it not really true, or is it absolutely false? <laughs> you know, they 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 could tell us that. You know, so I think statements like that, I'm I'm good at learning new things, and having them respond to that would be um, a valid way. I don't know if that's what you're asking, Stacey. I am. That's that precisely what I'm asking you, and you you answered it so well that I'm I'm thinking I have to be extra careful with how I write it down so I don't muddy what you just said. Um, I'm going to fumble through it, though. I think it's best I just start typing and then I'll edit it. So it's something about the degree of truth um, that kids um, uh, state. And no, normally it's not truth we talk about. It's agreement. Um, yeah, yeah, I would, yeah, I would agree. <laughs> the, the agreement the of seen, the, the kids. The kids seen in statements. Yeah. In um, statements like... Uh, I am I am good yeah. at learning, learning in general, or learning this. Well, I guess that's this is where you start to find out what the what your your cohort of students really think and how much they love learning. Because you can you have some kids whose resilience allows them to be fantastic at learning new things. You know, you get certain boys who'd be great at learning. You know, who will persist through a game of football if with a broken leg, but put them in the classroom and ask them to work through a maths problem, and they lose their minds. Mm. So, mm -hmm. um, so you would I, I would I would be asking questions like I'm good at learning new things, but I'd also be asking questions like you know. Um, I, I can stick with a problem in maths, you know, to find out if there's variations about their resilience for different subjects that they need to work through. And you could even, you know, extend that further to I'm good at solving problems, I'm good at learning new things with other people. Yeah, great. Okay, yeah. so this could actually be a range of questions that kind of bundle into this, this one quantification in a sense. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Now I'm looking at what I've written and there's a little tweak I'd like to make and I'm, I'm wondering, Adam, if you can imagine that if, if you were to put this, this statement to a, a room full of kids or a school full of kids and you will be putting other statements to them as well, but just this one general one, I'm good at learning new things, we could really, um, everybody might give a slightly different rating of how much they agree with that or how true that is for them. 
Some might say, oh, that's yeah. a 2 out of 10 for me, and others would say, oh, that's a 10 out of 10. Yeah. To gather that data, can you imagine that we might average what those ratings are? Yeah, I guess most schools would lead to that in terms of trying to find an area that they wanted to work on first. Yeah. Yeah. Good. All right. So what we've done is we've written down now our first potential measure for this result of kids love learning. And it could be the average level of agreement that kids see in statements like, I am good at learning new things. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Groovy. Uh, what I would normally do is say, can you think of another way that we could quantify that first um, sensory evidence of kids describe themselves as a learner? Um, we might not do that, Adam. We might we might just sort of keep it keep it interesting and go straight to the next one and see if we could think of a way to quantify that. So here you said you want, you want less of kids withdrawing or avoiding or attacking others or themselves with with blame. Um, less of them saying I suck at this. Less of them hiding under the desk or wagging. Um, there are quite a few different dimensions to that, so I imagine you could think of quantifying different aspects of it, but I'll let you pick. What's just the first thing that comes to your mind about how you could quantify that second sensory evidence? So I think most of that, that shame and embarrassment comes from the, the feeling of failure. Mm -hmm. So I'd be interested to find out here um, how the kids respond to getting things wrong. You know, do they see making mistakes as part of the learning process or do they see it as... I suck, and as a as, as a static uh, labeling experience, you know. So I'd be I'd be perhaps asking them. You know, it'd be almost similar to number one, but mm -hmm. asking them questions like, um, I, I I'm fine when I make a mistake. I am fine. And perhaps when we, uh, I, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I might word it differently. I don't know, but um, and I guess here though, I probably as a school leader, wouldn't look for the average. I'm interested here on who are the kids who aren't coping. So I'd be looking for kids, if we were scaling it, say, out of a zero to five, I'd be looking for the kids who answer zero and one and two. I want to identify them so that I can bring support to them around that. Okay, that's good. I'm going to write down um, something a little bit different to what you're saying, and I'll explain why I'm doing that just once I figure out how to frame it. So it'll be the percentage... Um, of kids that give an agreement of zero, oh, oh, hang on, of less than, I think you said up to two, so we'll say less than three. Yeah, uh, yeah, less than, less than three out of five, if that was the way we were doing it. Five. Um, in statements like, I am fine when I make a mistake. The grammar might not be perfect, but Adam, the reason I went to percentage is that with a measure, what we're trying to do is track change over time as well as let it flag to us when we have to drill down into the data and take action from the data. Yeah, that makes sense. Yep. So this, the data for this measure would serve both purposes. Firstly, we'd be able to track over time. Is that percentage of kids giving in an agreement of less than three, is that is that percentage growing or is that shrinking and or is it not changing? And so if it's if it's not improving, then we've got to look at what we're doing and do exactly what you described before. Let's look at the kids who are giving those ratings and let's let's find out what we've got to do to, to help them love mistakes and it's for the a, right reasons. A valuable thing that if I'm a if I'm a teacher in a school, I think teachers have a hunch they have a hunch that kids are coping less well than, say, kids did 20 years ago to speak to an experienced teacher. I say, do you have a fit? And I ask them often, do you, do you think that the cohort of kids you have now are more or less resilient about their learning than the kids that you taught 20 years ago? And they all say that they're concerned. They think that kids 20 years ago were better capable of sort of going, oh, okay, I made a blue, it's all right. Whereas kids these days see learning as a high stakes game. And if you get it wrong, then you must be a bad learner. Mm, that's really interesting. Uh, something I just want to draw out of what you just said, Adam, is you use the word resilience, and then you def mm. which is a weasel word, but you defined it. You said it's about how comfortable they are with with um, failure, with making mistakes, with being less than perfect. Yep. Yeah, I like that. It's a habit that is really hard to get out of. I find. I, I don't know if you notice it, Adam. Just weasel words just spill out of people's mouths so easily, but often we forget. Well, we've got to. 
and they often get sort of, for me, I think in schools, they get rolled into other weasel words and we in the end don't know what we're talking about. So we talk about in schools resilience and self-esteem as though they're the same thing and they're not. You know, resilience is your ability to thrive despite risk and self-esteem is do you understand that, you know, pro that, that, um, that positive self talk is linked to achievement rather than just existence. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, you know, we've got an issue in American schools where, you know, they... Um, there are kids coming out of, um, you know, graduating from high school and from college with reduced academic rates, you know, basically in America's history, the first time ever they've had kids who are coming out of their school system performing worse academically than previously. But um, but what they're, what they're finding is that their self-esteem rates are through the roof. So they think they're awesome, but they're not. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's kind of, you know, you, can have too, you can't have too much resilience, but you can have too much self-esteem. So I think that's that resonates with teachers and this kind of work would allow them to drill into that, yeah. Lovely. How are we going for time, Adam? Can I keep you for a bit longer? You can stay as far away. I thought it might be interesting just to go one, have one more go at this sensory evidence statement because it's got a lot in it, just to see if we could come up with maybe one, a third potential measure for it. And the bit I'm curious about, and I'm, I'm hoping you might be too, is not so much the what the kids might say if they were given a statement, but more um, a way of quantifying the behaviours that teachers might be observing in the classroom or, or wherever. Yep, that makes sense. Can you think of any quantification of that about the hiding under the desk, the wagging, the attacking others, the withdrawing or avoiding behaviours that, that teachers might observe that could be quantified? I, I think that one of the things that teachers often talk to me about is task avoidance. So mm -hmm. do they see, are they seeing students who quickly begin their learning or are they hesitating and avoiding? So um, I think that's a, teachers will often tell me that that's a sign of whether the kids, you know, are keen to learn or not. So are they getting started quickly and getting stuck into it? Okay, so would, we could focus more on the, the positive side of that and look at, you know, to what degree is, are the kids in the classroom starting immediately and getting stuck into it? Do you, do yep. you prefer that? Do you prefer looking at the positive side of, of something or...? Uh, I, I do. I guess that, you know, what I try to do is say, you know, try to solve the problem that we that we see. So if we're seeing kids who um, who are task avoiding and who are doing whatever they can to get out of having to demonstrate learning, then let's find out what that's all about. But um, the flip is what are the kids doing who um, who relish getting started with their own learning and can't wait for the teacher to shut up so they can get started? <laughs> Oh, this is going to be really disgusting for probably most of our listeners to hear, but maybe they'll understand it given the line of work I'm in these days. I was like that in maths class. I just wanted the teacher to shut up so I could start getting stuck into solving the math problem in front of me. I loved it. Yeah, that's right. And that's yeah, that's a, a big thing for us in schools is starting to move from being for far more teacher-centred to learner-centred. Oh, brilliant. I think that's not a bad job on that one there, Adam, that something like the percentage of students in the classroom who quickly start and get stuck into learning tasks, I think you said, which is um, yeah. a bit specific, and observed by teachers. That's definitely quantifiable. It is, yep. Any teacher could could run a rule over that really quickly. Mm, lovely. Well, that's good. Now, and in reality, Adam, we'd go on for a little bit longer and we'd, we'd probably end up with six, seven, eight, ten potential measures and we wouldn't want to have them all. We wouldn't want to be measuring all those things. We have to figure out which are the, the best ones to put our time and effort into. So we'd probably look at which ones had the most strength. In other words, had the mo convinced us the most that kids love learning um, and also look at at how feasible that they are to implement. In other words, can we actually get the data for this? Is, is it going to be worth spending the effort and time to get the data for it, or do we already have the data? Does that make sense? Yeah, that, that does make a lot of sense, yeah. And I think that, you know, schools are looking for uh, being able to drive that themselves rather than use tools that are uh, more of a one-size-fits-all, uh, you know, a mandated tool that they need to use. I, I agree with that. I think often the mandated tools end up uh, being generic and not specific or suitable for any one <laughs> situation, and they, yeah, they just you just feel, kind of feel like you're you're backed into a corner and you're, you're not getting the value you want out of it. Yeah. Um, 
let's let's have a quick play with this strength and feasibility for the three measures we've got here. But like I said, in reality, you'd probably have a lot more and you'd really need to do some shortlisting. Um, I, I rate strength on a one to seven scale just because I've done some testing actually and found out that, that the one to seven <laughs> works best for this particular application of shortlisting measures. So seven means it's on its own. This measure would totally convince me that kids loved learning. A five or a six would be, yeah, it's, it's damn good, but I'd probably want another measure to kind of go with it to help fill out the picture. But a, a, fees, a strength, sorry, of kind of uh, two or three or four is like, you know, oh, I'd be taking a bit of a leap if I were to use this measure to um, convince me that kids love learning. Yeah. Our first one is the average level of agreement that kids see in statements like, I'm good at learning things. What strength would you give that one? I think that's in the five six range, you know, because you know it's specific enough for the kids to just give us direct feedback. But what we've got to understand is we're dealing with people whose brains aren't finished yet, so mm. kids could be having a good day or a bad day, but also not to be able to have the there's a potential that they won't have the full emotional intelligence to be able to describe how good they are at learning mm. new things. Yep. So you're always going to get some variation around context when you're working with kids. So I think in that five space would be accurate. Yep. Lovely. Now the feasibility side of it is thinking about could we get the data for this? Like like how hard or easy would it be? And again, it's a one to seven scale. Seven is usually the data's already there. Um, a, a five or a six is would be pretty easy to get it. Um, but a one or a two or a three is is good grief. We would have to invent a system and we'd have to spend a lot of money and it, it really would be hard to get the data. Where's this one lie on that spectrum? Oh, I think. Yeah, I don't want to get repetitive, but I think it's a five again. Yeah, you no know, the tools don't, The tools don't always exist to get data that specific, but um, but they wouldn't be too difficult to design either. Great. Second potential measure is the percentage of kids that give an agreement of less than three out of five in statements like, I'm fine when I make a mistake. What strength would you give that one? How convincing is that one of kids love learning? I know that it's a similar you know, sort of um, a, a similar way of finding the data as the as with the first, but the first measure there. But I think that's a six. I, I think that with because it's so specific and it's so relevant and real to kids. Mm. Um, I think they could describe that well. Um, in terms of feasibility, I think it's a five because all we're doing is looking to develop a really similar tool to the first measure. Yeah, lovely. Okay, well done. Third potential measure is the percentage of students in the classroom who quickly start and get stuck into learning tasks and teachers would be the observers of this and therefore the data collectors, no doubt. How would you rate the, the strength of, of this one? I'd go back to five on that because any time that we're observing, there's a little bit of subjectivity to it, which means that as, as educators, we're human as well. Mm. So you know, we can have good days and bad days and the kids can drag us in one of those directions too. <laughs> so um, I think that's a five. Um, the feasibility of it would probably be a, a six because all you need to do is observe. Yeah, you know, so it's you know observe and take notice. So I think that that wouldn't be difficult to do at all. Yeah, great. Perfectly done. I think potentially if we'd kept going with this, Adam, and, and had some more potential measures, you might have got another one or two that you gave a strength of six to. And what that would mean is that um, it, unless you got a seven, and a seven is a perfect measure, and, and in this, this situation I'm not sure you'd get a seven, you'd probably end yeah. up choosing two or three of the measures that you gave a six to as long as their feasibility was, was five or six. Yeah. Yeah. That does make sense, yeah. Yeah. So there we go. I mean, we've gone, th we've started with this idea of school effectiveness, which a lot of people would look at and go, oh my God, how do you measure it? It's immeasurable. Or they just jump to trivial stuff that they already had easy data for, which really isn't that convincing of school effectiveness. We took that phrase and we've figured out what it really means and brought it down into the physical world. Um, kids love learning being one of those. Um, definitions of what school effectiveness is and we've come up with uh, a few potential ways that we can actually quantify it. So something vague like school effectiveness when you take it through the right conversation, the right series of um, hoops you called them before, uh, you end yeah. up with um, something that's really meaningful and really measurable. Yeah that's wonderful Stacey, I, yeah, I, it's definitely an approach and you know, 
I hope I get a copy of this little uh, podcast as well. <laughs> I, think I, need, I've got some, I think I've got some schools who would, who would really appreciate having a look. Oh, that's good. And look, the brilliance that you've brought to this is just the depth of knowledge you have about how um, – how schools and learning and uh, how all of that actually happens. I mean, obviously, you've been immersed in it for your, your whole career. I mean, you started out as a teacher. Yeah, I did. Yeah, so this is, you know, 25 years or so of doing this now. Yeah. yeah. And you have a really unique perspective, um, having moved out of being a teacher and then out of being a principal, and, and now you're kind of working in the whole system and you're able to see it from an, a point of view, from a, a perspective that a lot of the people working in the schools will never get to have because they're they're not down in the weeds, but they're right there on the front line and they're, they're, they're doing the darndest they can because the kids are the priority for them. You get to take that step back and you can, you can really um, pick up a lot of these patterns that are happening across, um, across schools and, and, you know, across that whole space of, of kids learning. So the brilliance that you have from that has is, is really made this conversation we've just had just fall, fall out quite easily. Yeah, well, thank you. It's a, it's a privileged position I've got to be able to, you know, not only have worked in the system, but to, to now be helping, you know, to work on it. So, um, yeah, I, I, I appreciate your comments there, Stacey. Thank you. Oh, I'm, I really admire the work you do. Adam, do you have any final thoughts that, that you'd like to share or just get off your chest about, about this idea of measuring school effectiveness? Um, no, other than I think that it's such a powerful thing that you've taught me today, Stacey, to be able to put, I guess, in the hands of our educators what, what school effectiveness means rather than wait for someone else to tell them in terms that perhaps they'd like to measure but not that the that the school the people actually working in the school would like to measure. So I think that one of the your process for me, what stands out for me, I've written it down here, is that that whole idea of ownership over school effectiveness, I think, then becomes the school's business because we got to define it. We got to say what we meant by it. And I think that's, I don't know, it's such a powerful thing that you're doing, Stacey. So I, I can't wait to share this with um, with other people who work in school. So thank you for having me. Oh, my, my pleasure entirely. It's, it felt like a real collaboration, which is not normal for an interview, but I so appreciate the collaboration. <laughs> <laughs> well, Adam, thank you very much for your time. I know we, we went a little bit longer than we'd planned to, and I'm so glad we did, but, but thank you very much for joining me. Pleasure all mine, Stacey. Thank you for having me. Right. Okay, everybody, this is Adam Voigt and Stacey Vass signing off. <laughs>